welcome back to Security in the 21st Century. My name is Suzanne Loftus, I'm your host, and I have with me today, Dr. Mark Galliotti. Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. So Mark is the Principal Director at Mayak Intelligence, as well as an Honorary Professor at UCL School of Slavonic and East European Studies. So Mark, could you tell us a little bit about what Mayak Intelligence actually is? Sure, it's, it's a very small consultancy shop. Um, at the moment, it's just me, though in February, uh, we'll be taking on a, uh, an additional person to be basically head of our Russia program. And essentially, both I and the people I sort of subcontract to a various network of people, what we do is we provide quite specialist Russia related consultancy support for really three markets. One of them is, is governments where it tends to be about basically the sort of harder edge security and politics issues. Secondly, business who tend to be much more involved in due diligence and such like. And the third element is actually working with the nonprofit sector. Do, I do quite, quite a lot of work, again, in, in providing support and assistance for them in a whole variety of different sort of environments. So really, it's, it's essentially, I hesitate to say it's Mark and his friends, um, but essentially it, it, it is a vessel whereby I and my, con my network of contacts can actually sort of market our various forms of expertise to wider audiences. Well, excellent, and congratulations for putting that together. Thank you. So uh, Mark is a specialist in Russian security and international politics, very much like myself. So this conversation will be particularly interesting for me. Um, let's talk a bit about some of the pieces you've written. I'd like to start by discussing Russian domestic politics. You wrote something quite fascinating about the Silovic industrial complex and uh, the role more specifically of the National Guard within that complex. So how about first defining this uh, Silovic industrial complex for the audience? Well, I mean, in some ways it, it was, again, the usual perils of, of going for a, a snappy title. It's because what I was trying to do in, in that particular article, which is part of a, of a wider uh, Norwegian funded research project, is essentially to look at how the National Guard can be used in some ways as a case study. It's not just about its repressive capabilities and so forth, or indeed what it says about Kremlin concerns, it's also about, well, how does an institution, particularly a, a relatively new institution just created in 2016, how does it basically consolidate its position within the Russian bureaucratic system and then seek to expand it? And the point is there's a whole variety of different strategies that Russian institutions tend to use. And when we look particularly at the National Guard, it's really quite striking. It hasn't sought really to build for itself any kind of wider public support base in a way that, for example, the military is very assiduous doing, in doing in trying to reach out. It's got its exhibitions and its cathedrals and its TV channel and such like. Nor is it particularly interested in building a really strong network of allies within the legislature, which, again, if you look at, for example, the, the FSB, the Federal Security Service, the Investigatory Committee, they've all done that quite a lot. One area, though, where the National Guard has been very active is precisely in terms of moving into business. And in part, that's because when it was created, as well as the public order forces that were part of the Interior Ministry, it was given FGUP Ochrana, Federal State Unitary Enterprise Ochrana, which is basically the, the, the state's own private security arm. And at the same time, it was given the authority to monitor and to license other private security agencies, which is a fairly classic case of, of basically putting the fox in charge of the hen house, because mysteriously enough, we've seen that a whole bunch of different agencies have started to have trouble with their registration. Troubles which instantly go away the moment they accept to become incorporated within FGUP Ochrana. And therefore, when we look at the, at the National Guard, it is clearly a silovic, a force bearing agency. It, it is a security force, but it also increasingly has this business role and it's, it leverages its security capacity to build market share. And this is why I thought it was interesting to think of it because we, we, we tend to look at these agencies either as simply security forces or as purely executive arms of the Kremlin. And this is a way of saying, okay, but what does it do of its own intent? And the answer is make money. Wow, that's pretty interesting. You wouldn't have thought that just from reading about it uh, superficially. 
And uh, so this National Guard was implemented in 2016. I was wondering, could you tell us why it was implemented only then? And was there some type of controversy about it being implemented into the society? Perhaps this was due to, say, changing threat perception within the country. Uh, please elaborate. Yes, and to a large extent, it was changing threat perceptions with a little side order of uh, internal personalistic politics. But yeah, as you say, I mean, this is an idea which has bubbled up really since the 1990s. But particularly, we, we had it under Putin. And indeed, when, as he was then President Medvedev, was sort of contemplating, it seems, uh, running for office again, there were those within his team who were suggesting this probably as a way of creating a security force that could be under one of his loyalists. But each time the decision was made, considering the political costs, considering the dislocations that it would cause and the expense it would cause, right? You know, not, I mean, even on, on a trivial level of having to issue new uniforms and repaint the vehicles and everything else, it really just wasn't worth it. The reason why in 2016 that decision seemed to have changed is I think, as you say, threat perceptions. Ever since the, the Bolotnaya protests, which, which heralded Putin's return to, to, to power, there had been this growing concern, uh, I, I would say a concern bordering on the paranoid within the Kremlin about the risks of mass unrest at a time when there was considerable degrees of general sort of discontent, even after the 2014 Crimean popularity bump. At the same time, there was rumblings of discontent from within the interior ministry. We could realize the extent to which actually the, the interior ministry, although obviously it is an arm of the Kremlin, nonetheless, it's made up of people who on the whole are, are cops, part of the, the global confraternity of police um, and they wanted in the main to do their job. I think it's going to, it's obviously I've been, this is something I've been looking at for, for uh, dating myself decades. Um, and speaking particularly to the newer generation of police officers, um, you know, it's really quite striking the extent to which they, they actually are not just in it for corruption and the chance to throw their weight around. They want to do the job. And part of that means having a positive relationship with society. And the current interior minister, Kolokoltsev, who is, unlike his predecessor, Nurgaliev, who came from the sort of KGB, FSB environment, Kolokoltsev is a career cop. He understands that. He regularly states this point. And we've seen a whole load of efforts being made precisely to try and close the yawning gulf between Russian people and the Russian police. With some success, it's still a big gulf. But part of that was exactly a dissatisfaction with the idea of being seen and used as the stormtroopers of the state. And this was beginning to be communicated, particularly from regional commands to the central MVD, the interior ministry, and then quietly, cautiously, because Kol Kolokoltsev has very, very little political capital with the Kremlin. He's not one of Putin's mates or anything like that, but cautiously communicated up. Now, the hope, I think, was that they could in some ways change Kremlin policy to make it a little bit less brutishly confrontational on the streets. Well, they did change policy, just not in the way they'd intended, because I think what happened was, and this is where the personalistic element came in. This is exactly the same time in which Zolotov, who is now the head of the National Guard, who was formerly the head of Putin's personal uh, protection team, was clearly agitating for a role. And so they put two and two together, and, and that made National Guard. So they took all the, the public order forces out of the interior ministry, created this new standalone agency and put Zolotov in charge. A man who I think it's fairly easy to say is not excessively troubled by conscience morality and the, the trivial details of law. So he's exactly the kind of person to unleash on the streets if you felt you had to. I think this is not because the Kremlin imminently thought they would need to on a mass scale, but they wanted to have that card or truncheon in their pocket. And in terms of controversy, Obviously, it created a certain amount of controversy at the time, um, because clearly it looked like a, a threatening and intimidating gesture on the side of, of the Kremlin. Interestingly, though, it was also quite problematic within the security apparatus. The interior ministry suddenly lost a whole chunk of capacity in a way that was clearly embarrassing and humiliating for Kolokoltsev and the ministry as a whole, not least because Nothing had been thought through. I mean, if I can just go into full wonk mode for a moment, just to kind of give a very specific example. Part of the forces which were transferred were the Sober, were kind of rapid response SWAT teams. 
Now, in the past, their, one of their main roles was precisely to provide urgent assistance when ordinary police found themselves in a dangerous situation. You know, you, you stop a car and suddenly it turns into an armed siege. That's when you call the Solbor. And that was easy enough when they were part of the same subordination. All of a sudden now, they're part of a different agency. And I remember actually talking to a couple of cops, literally this would have been, it was in Moscow a week or so after the, the announcement had been made, who were saying, they had absolutely no idea how this was gonna work now. Um, can they contact Solba directly? Does it have to go up their chain of command and then down the National Guard chain of command? And lots of nuts and bolts things like, well, who would pay for it? Does it mean the Interior Ministry will have to refund the National Guard for Solba time? Things like that. I mean, a lot of these things which are in and of themselves sound quite trivial, but this is exactly the nuts and bolts of day-to-day -day life. So clearly that hadn't been thought through. You also had the, the Federal Security Service concerned about creation of a new agency on its sort of broad patch. We have the Investigative Committee again concerned because up to this point, its head, Bastrykin, had been the sort of the Rottweiler of choice. It was very unfair actually, Rottweilers are quite sweet dogs. But anyway, the Rottweiler of choice of the Kremlin and now there was Zolotov. So I think a lot of other sort of agencies were also quite concerned. So in some ways, there was a lot of short-term furore within society, but also quite long-term concern behind the scenes within the security apparatus. Mm, that's quite interesting because we, um, we often discuss uh, Putin's role in the society and how he has uh, basically absolute control over everything that goes on. And, uh, you know, the appointment of governors in different uh, regions is one. And then just the, the Stiloviki uh, network that he is, um, aware of and, you know, appoints people that he knows to different businesses and companies and government agencies. Um, so in this respect, with the National Guard now on the scene, uh, as, as well as the FSB still on the scene, and then in terms of this elite system that exists in Russia, are there turf wars in between them? Is it, are we seeing a new split in the elite? Because that would really mean a lot for Putin's hold over society, which uh, you know, is responsible for keeping the country together, basically. Yes, I, I wouldn't, I mean, a split implies two sides. I think what we more see is that the natural workings of this system is actually one of constant bureaucratic struggles and factional and individual struggles. It's actually, you know, this is not the ruthlessly disciplined power vertical of, of, of the myth in which precisely all the information goes up to Putin and he distributes everything. He is not a micromanager by his own account. I mean, he doesn't like the idea of manual control as he calls it. Plus increasingly, I, I would hesitate to call him lazy, but nonetheless, you know, he doesn't exactly seem to be burning the midnight oil um, working on it, and he sort of very much relies on what on the reports and so forth that reach him. This is not a man who who travels much. He doesn't even go into the Kremlin most of the time. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's again, it's very much dependent on what information you get in. And in that context, you know, I think in part as a way of precisely controlling the the security apparatus, he often to an extent encourages constant low level competition. When it gets too serious, when it gets too potentially destabilizing. He steps in and resolves it, as we saw when, for example, previously there had been this really quite serious rivalry between the Federal Security Service and the now disbanded Federal Anti-Drug Service. But most of the time, he's actually fine with seeing that going on. And we have seen that with, with, with the National Guard. For example, they are basically the guys who kick down the doors. They're not necessarily the guys who know which doors to kick down. For that, in a way, targeting comes from somewhere else. And that was one of the first areas that the National Guard pushed on. They said, well, look, we, we really need to have our own investigative service precisely so that we can do that. And that was absolutely parking his tanks on the FSB and in the investigatory committee lawn. And that was very quickly dealt with. Then they tried to get into the burgeoning area of controlling social media, which again became was a kind of a, a sexy hot topic area. Often after all, these are not about um, operationally sensible missions. They are about getting involved in what for the moment seems to be the Kremlin's priority, because that's where resources and, and prestige come from. But again, that, that was pushed back. I mean, it's an interesting thing. Although the creation of, of the National Guard was a, was a major snub to a whole variety of agencies, since then, Zolotov has 
pretty much proven unable to muscle into any of the additional areas in which he wants, has, has wanted to, to expand to. Which again, so shows the danger if you are essentially an outsider. Zolotov is not particularly well liked by his peers. They regard him as an overpromoted thug and with, I would suggest, good reason. Um, the, the whole farcical moment when he challenged Alexei Navalny to a duel. Um, I mean, that, I, I find it fascinating that it's not just that it was derided by the obvious kind of liberal oppositionist uh, media and commentariat, but also within, for example, the kind of telegram channels, which tend to be expressing the views of people within the security apparatus. I mean, they too were, were horrified because it just looks embarrassing for them all. So yes, there's, there's constant turf wars, there's constant individual and, and personal and factional struggles that go on. And in terms of the kind of bigger picture, it does raise interesting questions because all of this depends precisely on Putin's capacity to gauge when these turf wars become problematic and then to resolve them in a decisive way. And he absolutely has the power to do that. I mean, he is still the decider. No one can, can stand up against him. He can sack anyone he wants. He can't always, well, he can promote anyone he wants, but there's always a political cost. We saw this when actually he tried to promote another one of his uh, ex bodyguards. And it's again, says something about his shrinking circle that the kind of people he turns to, people he knows are often umbrella carriers and bodyguards. Dumin. There was talk of, of Dumin being made head of GRU, military intelligence. And this is something that the, the military were not keen on because they didn't think he was up to the job. Um, and interestingly enough, the FSV were not keen on either because they didn't want to establish the precedent that, that, that basically Putin can just parachute one of his ex bodyguards into heading a security apparatus. So you actually had a behind the scenes lobbying campaign, um, a lot of whispering about Dumin's incapacity for the job, a lot of delaying action, and eventually Putin let the idea drop. It's not that he couldn't have done it, but he obviously realized that the political costs of essentially having to embarrass Defense Minister Shoigu, Chief of the General Staff Gerasimov, were not worth it. Now, that means that you know, he, he is the decider with it within limits. And I think these kind of factional conflicts, they're, they're not a serious problem up to terribly banal point to make when they are. If they coincide with a sudden unexpected rise in public protest or some other destabilizing factor, that's when they, they could be problematic. It's a, not a very uh, functional way of running a, a system. It works okay up to that point. Well, we'll have to stay tuned for when that point will be. <laughs> um, so thanks for elaborating that. It's definitely a lot more complex behind the scenes, uh, the workings inside a, you know, the Russian government uh, and their, uh, their network. So switching more to foreign policy, we've been hearing a lot about the term hybrid warfare lately. So a lot of what goes into hybrid warfare is say propaganda, campaigns, uh, private military companies, and, and other means that uh, the Russians have engaged uh, with quite frequently in the last several years. So the West tends to say that Russia is engaged in hybrid warfare with us. However, Russia says the opposite. Russia claims that the West has been waging hybrid warfare on Russia all these years. So in what ways do they make these claims? I mean, what, what do they say that the West is doing Exactly. And um, this relates to what you wrote about the Gerasimov doctrine, actually. Uh, so many in the West assume that Russian grand strategy has a lot to do with this so-called Gerasimov doctrine, uh, which, uh, you know, discusses the, this very concept of hybrid war. So what did he actually mean to say and why do we have it all wrong? Yeah, well, I mean, let's let's start with this this term, the Gerasimov doctrine, which I swear I'll be <laughs> carrying around my neck like an albatross until I'm dead. Um, there is no such thing as a Gerasimov doctrine. Um, I made the mistake of using that as a title for a blog post when a particular article that has since become infamous of his came out. Um, really because a blog is after all an exercise in vanity, you want people to read it, and I wanted to give it a sort of snappy title, even though in the text I tried to make it clear that this wasn't actually a doctrine, and frankly 
the article and the speech it was based on were probably not even written by Gerasimov, who is a, a competent tank commander and fairly effective manager of the armed forces, but not what anyone would describe as a bleeding edge military theoretician. Anyway, his article, which came out in the, the military industrial courier, um, was essentially saying that uh, you know, we have a, a new challenge coming from the West, which is exactly that. Nowadays, it's possible using information operations and so forth and social media and destabilization generally to turn a perfectly working functional country very, very quickly into a, a state of anarchy into which you can then insert either your own proxy forces to set up a, a puppet regime or actually your own special forces and so forth. And very much what he was looking at were the, the countries which had been sort of hit by the color revolutions of the former Soviet space and the Arab Spring, because they were framing these as a result of precisely Western destabilization. And it, it does speak to um, an interesting blind spot or assumption within Kremlin thinkers, you know, particularly I'm talking about not just Putin, but those people on whom he seems to lean for most of his security thinking. And above all, we're talking about Nikolai Patrushev, Secretary of the Security Council, and in effect, the closest there is to a national security advisor within the Russian system. Patrushev is, in my opinion, smart and scary in that I think he has this phenomenally paranoiac view of the world in which basically everything that goes wrong for Russia and its allies is the result not just of you know, popular risings against inefficient and undemocratic regimes or whatever, but precisely schemes by its enemies. Um, and in that context, what, what Gerasimov was saying was this is what we face. We face a new era of war in which the West is going to come at us not with tanks, but precisely by destabilizing us. Does he actually believe that? I'm not so convinced. Because if you look at what the military is spending its money on, on how it exercises and so forth, it's still basically geared for straightforward, conventional peer-to-peer -peer conflict. And yes, it looks at how one can use cyber attacks and saboteurs and subversion to prepare the battlefield, as it did, for example, in Crimea. But let's be honest any military these days that is contemplating expeditionary operations is thinking in these terms. Because no war in history has ever not been hybrid, has ever not used whatever methods are possible to precisely undermine your enemy's will and capacity to resist. But more than anything else, if you're the chief of the general staff, you're not just a military commander. You are also essentially the military's advocate within the political scene for your budgets and so forth. This, this concern about suddenly that the West was able to bring countries down by its magical mind control powers or whatever, clearly was dominant within the Kremlin at this time. And Gerasimov, like a competent advocate, was just simply saying, don't worry guys, we're on top of this. We have a plan to respond, which is why you need to keep the money coming in. And we see in, in recent military exercises, you know, Zapad, Vostok and so forth, they often sort of start with the idea of, foreign country destabilizing, sending in its special forces. And the military's response is basically a, sort of a devastating barrage of conventional munitions of one form or another. So this was really him just trying to kind of reassure the Kremlin that the Kremlin, that you know, their concerns were understood by the military and, and responded to. Now, since then, obviously we, we, we have this whole struggle of exactly who, you know, who, is, who is doing what. From, from the Russians' point of view, precisely, they, they see this Gibridnaya Voina. I mean, it's interesting, they, they don't, it's not even as if they have their own term for it, they just simply Russified the, the Western term. Um, and, and they see that at work. And for example, the more hawkish individuals see that at work in Belarus, which is a classic example of a truly um, domestic, self-generated rising. But no, 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 there have to have been sort of sneaky forces at work, the CIA, or, and I must admit, God bless them, MI6, um, in the, this, this day and age, I still find it always so heartening that the Russians take, take British intelligence so seriously. Mm -hmm. So we take what comforts we can. Um, so, you know, they see that. Well, whereas likewise in the West, I think there, there has been something of a hysteria about this notion of Russian capacity to destabilize. Not because it, it's not there, but when we talk about hybrid war, 
I mean, although the problem is we don't really have a proper definition of what it means, um, but it generally means precisely the blending of military and non-military means. So in other words, the sense that, yes, someone's maybe me messing with your political system or spreading disinformation, you know, trying to encourage people to think about wedge issues that divide a country, et cetera, et cetera. Somehow that necessarily fits into a spectrum that goes to the point of military intervention. That you're then thinking, okay, but at what point do the little green men, at what point do the Spetsnaz commandos suddenly crop up? Which I don't think is the case. Because I think if we, if we have to understand how the Russians think about it, I think there are two parallel strands of thinking. One, which is the military, which is precisely that, well, if we are going to be de deployed in a, in a situation, we will use whatever methods at our disposal to try and ensure that the battlefield is tilted our way as much as possible. And then there is the thinking of the, the civilian national security establishment. And particularly here, we are talking about the Secretariat of the Security Council, Patrushev again, who actually see in these various sort of non-military instruments an alternative way of getting what they want. War is after all in Clausewitzian terms, as the Russians see it, simply a way of getting another country to do what you want it to do. And their view is that precisely by destabilizing and dividing and subverting, they can somehow get, get what they can't get militarily because they are fully aware of the extent to which NATO is a much, much more powerful alliance. So a very long answer um, to, to, to your question, I'm afraid. There is no Gerasimov doctrine. Um, what there is, is a belief that one can use non-military means to prepare the battlefield for military purposes. But there is also this parallel perspective, which is, I think is much more important and much more what we face in the West, which is actually that these non-kinetic, non non-military means are an alternative to the use of force. Yes, exactly. Um, and it's important that you mentioned that no war that has ever been fought was not a hybrid war. This is not, these are not new strategies. Um, they're just more discussed in the last few years due to these, um, well, due to the, you know, new uh, national security doctrine or strategy that we're in great power competition and Russia is using asymmetric strategies to to, um, to basically gain relative power. And because it doesn't have the same uh, capabilities economically or militarily, it uses other types of strategies to get in a way what it wants. And in some ways it's highly effective and in other ways less, but we do make a very big deal out of it in the West. Um, it's definitely a, a big topic of discussion these days. And I will, 2016 elections were were very dramatic uh, for that, and there were lots of, you know, the discovery of so many accounts hacked and people's, um, you know, minds may have been influenced here and there to vote for a particular candidate. And then even in Europe, uh, you know, just um, business relations, um, uh, propaganda channels uh, in different countries advocating for a more uh, for an anti-Western message, one that's more kind of um, one that undermines, you know, liberal democracy and says the liberal democratic project is just another way to to um, you know show to to take power and control over certain areas. Uh, it's just you know hidden with the guise by the guise of democracy and um, and this message is kind of taking a lot of dynamics and a lot of. Um, energy behind it, especially with European populist leaders. We hear similar kind of anti-globalist uh, sentiments and whatnot. So these strategies really do kind of find a way to divide and conquer a little bit, and they're certainly not to be uh, ignored. Well, if I can just actually follow up on that. I'm sorry, I'm just finishing a um, one, one, one of my sort of forthcoming books. It's kind of provisionally titled The Weaponization of Everything precisely looks at this extent. And it's not just about different thinking, it also just simply reflects the way the world has changed now. On the one hand, military conflict has become ridiculously expensive, not just in financial terms, but also this much less willingness to, on the part, even of in, within authoritarian regimes to accept mass casualties. But at the same time, we now operate within essentially a single information space, a single economic space in a way we never had. And the classic example is uh, back in the day, the KGB ran something called Operation Denver on a 
mistakenly called Operation Infection, which was precisely a bid to try and convince people that HIV AIDS had come about from an American uh, biowar experiment. Now, this took years because they had to very carefully, they had to set up front organizations, they floated it in uh, sort of a, 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 um, Indian newspapers that they controlled and didn't get much traction, so they picked it up elsewhere. And again, this is a, pro a project that took years and never really had a great deal of effect. Then you compare that with, for example, the attempts to try and suggest that COVID-19 had come out of, again, American biological warfare experimentation. And in the age of social media and the internet, and also in an age in which actually people do get their news, not just from newspapers and TV and radio channels, which are kind of controlled by certain, shall I say, gatekeepers, but are just as likely to, to get it from some website or something that someone forwarded to them on Facebook or whatever. You know, it, it managed to metastasize literally in days and actually proved more effective in terms of you know, in influencing audiences. So I think you know, the, the point is now we have to realize that in fact the world from the economic interconnectivities that allow sanctions to become much more effective through to the, sort of the, the nature of the way we, we, we get our news and spread information. All of these have I think also contributed massively to the, the, the capacity of countries to use these non-kinetic means to influence and even damage others. Absolutely, that's a, a vital point. And also in, in terms of spreading uh, information on social media, the more sensationalist a piece of news is, the faster it gets spread. And they've demonstrated that so many times. Lies mm -hmm. get spread so much faster than truth. So it's hard to overcome this problem that we're experiencing. Russia and the Russian elites have used the term political warfare to define what's going on between Russia and the West. And um, I think that we can also fit the discussion of the recent Navalny poisoning into this uh, topic. So could you tell us a little bit um, what this means, political warfare, and if the actions that the, Russian, that the Russian side seems to be taking, are they all controlled from the top? Or are there different factions within government that are making autonomous decisions, such as, for example, the Navalny poisoning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, political war, which I must admit is, is a term that I, I find a lot more useful than, than hybrid war um, to explain the current situation. I mean, frankly, it goes back to, to George Kennan, you know, the archetypal American scholar diplomat and architect of, of um, early Cold War policy in, in the States, who defined political war as the use of every means at a state's disposal, overt and covert, legal, illegal, short of war, to achieve national ends. And I think that's very much how, how the Russians think of it these, these days. For reasons both reasonable and also thoroughly unreasonable, the Kremlin seems to regard itself as being within an existential political struggle with the West. Not so much actually existential in the sense of because you know, the future of the Russian Federation as a nation, though there are some that believe that, uh, that particularly the United States has a long-term plan for the dismemberment of the Russian Federation. Um, again, it's, it's quite a, a sweet assumption that any such plan could, could, could sort of track through the political process and not be leaked within 48 hours to, to, to the post of the Times. But even without that, there is a sense that Russia's status as a great power, Russia's capacity to project itself in the world, which is not just simply about ego, it's also about, again, political autonomy, you know, they have this very kind of simplistic and, and, and brutish notion that essentially you are either a, a rule setter or a rules acceptor, that you are either a hegemon or you are a subordinate nation. Well, Russia's capacity to be on the right side of that equation is under threat because the West is trying to, to marginalize, to silence, to ignore Russia. And also to assert forms of what we could think of as soft regime change to in effect change the political calculus within the country, to support certain sort of forces, oppositionist and other, to undermine the Kremlin. Um, as I said, there, there, there are some grounds for that, but it's, it's framed in, in this rather sort of paranoiac conspiratorial worldview. 
And in that context, they feel that their only chance is precisely to divide the West, to distract the West, and to demoralize the West. And to do that, they have to use whatever means are at their disposal. So in some ways, this is the kind of, this is the total war mindset, but applied in, in non-kinetic terms. So in some ways, again, to follow the same kind of metaphor, what it means is that you know, any Russian business or whatever can be, shall we say, conscripted. From time to time, it can be told, we need you to do this. And clearly, you don't get a chance to say no. Same way as we've seen this, for example, with, with Russian-based organized crime networks from time to time being used as an asset by Russian intelligence services. So there is that sense that you might say every, every body, every institution, every agency within Russia, when is necessary, has to accept that it must play its part in this total political war against the West. Now, obviously, managing that is the issue. And we, get, we go back to this point about the, the power vertical isn't really a power vertical. And Putin's style of rule is not like such that. I do not see Putin as the kind of detailed strategist who has a very clear sense of a goal and above all, a roadmap of how to get there. He has a sense of his goal, his overall objective, which again is, is Russia as a great power with a sphere of influence, with a voice, and that means a veto on every single crucial matter around the world and also the right to flout international law from time to time, because he sees essentially America as having these things. And then he thinks, well, that's, that's what we should aspire to. But that's fine as a kind of long-term goal, but how to get there? Not, not so much. So I think what we have a tendency in, in, instead in, in the Russian system is that you know, broad objectives, broad interests are communicated. And then a whole variety of other agencies and agents compete to try and do something that they feel would, would, would get Russia closer to that stage. So it's very much, it's, it's bottom up rather than top down. And it's a very parsimonious strategy because it means you don't have to put state resources into all of this. It's one that in effect mobilizes and capitalizes on the ambitions and imaginations of a whole variety of Russians. It's one that's very, very hard for us to plan for. Because again, we, we do have a tendency to be looking for coherent plans. And human beings are great um, pattern recognition engines. And if, we, if there isn't a pattern there, we will probably invent one. So we're constantly inventing strategies that we think the Russians are doing. When in fact, actually often you've got five, 10 different and contradictory schemes underway. And so, you know, the, the parallel I've sometimes used is we, we keep looking for a great white shark, a single formidable predator with a single, if small, brain. Whereas in fact, we're dealing with, with a shoal of piranhas, each of which is individually much, much less formidable than the shark. But the point is, while we're dealing with one, the rest could be eating the flesh off our backs. And so in, in this environment, I think Putin, he sets the tone. There are clearly certain operations which absolutely are run by state agencies and with the approval or initiative from above. I mean, for example, these things tend to be the ones where you know that they're gonna result in a major international incident. The attempt to assassinate Sergei Skripal in Britain, for example, I have no doubt, but that that would have had to have been signed off by the boss. And then there's a lot of other activities which probably don't get, don't need to sign off. And then they can be disowned or they can be amplified depending on whether they are successful. If you take the, the, the Navalny case, for example, I mean, my view was originally that it probably wouldn't, again, that this is not something that the Kremlin would have regarded as useful. Um, that instead it was one of the other big beasts within the system who either had a personal grudge against Navalny or, and or, felt close enough to Putin that the, basically the boss would retrospectively bless it. In a similar way as the murder of Boris Nemtsov, um, it seems fairly clearly to have been done by Kadyrov, not with Putin's approval, but presumably Kadyrov thought Putin would approve. I have to say with Nemtsov, I've changed my mind. The news that in fact, it was a different um, new version of Novichok makes it much less likely that it was some kind of secondary actor, shall we say. I think that suggests to me that in fact, this was something that was done by the state apparatus, which would have been, which would have required Putin's sign off. 
and therefore I think it might might suggest a, a shifting paradigm in how the Russian state looks at controlling its opposition. Absolutely, and that last one you were you were referring to Nemtsov, you said, though, right? Mm -hmm. So when it comes to Navalny, for me, for example, when I first saw that in the news, I said, no, it can't be from the top because. It, it's too obvious, you know, it's like, oh, Navalny is uh, the biggest uh, opposition and he's, um, you know, always trying to um, just criticize the Kremlin uh, internationally. And he has a fan base internationally and domestically, uh, maybe not a significant one, but a, a big enough one to to make uh, headlines. And um, he's also he shows that democracy kind of does exist. <laughs> In Russia, because there is an opposition force, and you know this opposition uh, actor can can say what he likes, and so th when this happened, I said that it, it just completely undermines, uh, you know, the it because he helps them, he helps Putin by existing, he helps the Kremlin by existing. That's what I thought. So I I'm not surprised if it's um, if it was carried out by another actor. Uh, and, um, but I said, I mean, yeah. and I absolutely agree with you. And, and, and you know, it, it doesn't make sense to go after Navalny. But I said, I think that the use of, the, the, of this different form of Novichoks does suggest otherwise. And I think what the problem is, all we can ever really do, given that there is a, this black box at the very top of the Russian system, all we can ever really do is use past operations and activities to try and illustrate the present and predict the future, which is always a very sort of problematic act. Um, I mean, this is, for example, why I was wrong about Crimea. When they first took Crimea, I didn't think they'd actually go all the way to a full, full formal annexation. And that was based on past activity. It just didn't make sense in that context. But they did. There you go. Putin didn't ask me. Um, and I think what that showed us precisely, I think that was one of these paradigm shift moments where actually you know, the Kremlin, Putin and his cronies, decided that in fact the world had, had shifted to a point where Russia needed to adopt this much more aggressive forward policy in terms of asserting its interests. So too, I wonder, and as I said, this is only a, a wondering, is that by past measure, going after Navalny doesn't make sense. And we, we, we have this now infamous um, comment that, that Putin allegedly told uh, Venediktov of Echo Moskvi, that there's a difference between enemies and traitors. Enemies you fight with, but someday, hopefully, you'll make a deal with. Traitors, though, you can do nothing but wipe them out. Well, up to this point, Navalny seemed to be have considered to be an enemy, not a traitor. Now, it may be that that's shifting. It may be that an increasingly gerontocratic regime, which does seem to be, in some ways, rather unrealistically scared by you know, everything from, from social media to protesting Khabarovs to whatever, Maybe they, they have now adopted this new approach that says, actually, you know, this attempt at being a hybrid regime, a bit of authoritarianism with a little bit of democracy, maybe that's not going to work for us. Maybe we need to shift the, the, the slider, shall we say, more towards the authoritarian dimension. And frankly, they might have decided better to get Navalny out of the way now, not sort of at a point when we've got national elections or similar, you know, at a, a relatively stable point, a point where, you know, where the whole COVID issue might well have sort of hidden it. I mean, I don't know, I'm, I'm just trying to kind of create um, speculations. But what I think is clear though, is, I mean, you know, Navalny's survival was very much a matter of chance. Um, you know, if the air crew had not very quickly decided to divert to Omsk, um, then probably he'd have been dead by the, by the time they, they reached Moscow, or at least... If the first responder team, the Reanimatsia ambulance that was waiting on the tarmac at Omsk, they'd not immediately thought, hang on, we, we better um, give him atropine, which is the sort of the, the appropriate response, then he might well have not, you know, or basically been, been moribund by the time he reached the hospital. If the FSB had not been quicker, at locking down Omsk, you know, all of, all of these things. I mean, actually, it was not a foregone conclusion that Navalny would survive. And I expect no one imagined there was gonna be this international dimension of a German NGO pushing hard and then being backed by the German government to medivac him. I mean, all of these were contingencies that probably they hadn't thought of or didn't think were likely. 
could easily have been that Navalny would have died. They would have obfuscated. They would have said, no, 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 you know, we have the usual thing of 50 different narratives being presented as a way of hiding the truth. Oh, you know, he, it, it, was, it was just a sort of an imbalance in his system. Oh, he was taking pills. Oh, what, you know, people would have constructed all these things. Yes, there would have been a bit of a furore. Yes, there would have been a protest, but then it would have become history again. So, I, I mean, unfortunately, I can see how there could be a logic to it that suggests we're now moving into a more dangerous age in Russia. We'll have to wait and see. It's true. I mean, we have to think of all of the options because when we start to kind of uh, put Russia into a box and say that this is how they're acting because, you know, their grand strategy is A, so they're going to do B, which means C, but that's useless and it's always futile because there's always these kind of uh, mixed strategies that, to, that are maybe specifically intended to confuse uh, the competitor or or they're just completely unorganized so that it looks like they're organized and are probably laughing that we analyze them so closely. I don't know, but uh, it, it is quite interesting to 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 observe um, you know the different strategies that are that are used. And so in this context of um, you know hybrid warfare, political warfare, asymmetric strategies, um, we've, or the West rather, has implemented uh, certain pressure uh, techniques or mechanisms such as sanctions, for example. But sanctions in the end didn't end up changing Russia's behavior, uh, for example, in Ukraine. or uh, And then there was talk of sanctions uh, after this uh, Navalny poisoning. And then in the previous cases of poisoning, sanctions also were used. Is this maybe not the right uh, weapon or tool to be using now, should the West rather respond to hybrid warfare with hybrid strategies or would we completely be at, an, at a disadvantage? Would Putin have the escalation dominance, let's say? I mean, I, I suspect so. I mean, I think I, I can understand the immediate temptation to think of fighting hybrid with hybrid. Um, because it is active. It is that sense of being able to fight back. I mean, none of us want to feel like we're victims. However, it carries with it massive risks. It's precisely, this is an authoritarian regime. The risks are, first of all, that the Russians would just simply escalate their operations abroad. They could choose to be a lot more, more violent and vicious. I mean, you know, it's actually quite rare, for example, for the Russians to assassinate abroad. And many of the kind of quote unquote Russian sort of state killings that people sometimes talk about are actually more about business and criminal disputes rather than because the Kremlin willed them dead. They, they could do a lot more. Secondly, there is a point that actually it would in many ways force the regime to be much more authoritarian. I mean, there's talk, for example, that we should be providing a lot more assistance to Russian oppositionists, um, investigative journalists and such like. And again, I mean, it's worth noting there is an opposition there. There are very, very impressive investigative journalists working within Russia. However, if we in effect make them instruments of Western hybrid warfare, we are basically painting targets, bullseyes on them. And on obviously the regime is going to deal with them. I mean, you know, we, we have to assume that they're unpleasant, but not stupid. So, you know, actually what we'd end up doing is in some ways forcing the regime to be more authoritarian. And the third issue is this, look, in the grand scheme of things, however problematic, I don't think that what the Russians are doing really represents some kind of existential threat to Western democracy and so forth. All they can really do is exacerbate existing tensions, tensions, pressures and divisions within us. It's not as though there would not be the current, you know, that they wouldn't have been Brexit without the Russians. It's not as though if you look at the current Hungarian or Polish challenges to Brussels, mm -hmm. that, that, that that somehow was generated in, in Moscow. It's not as though Trump was, was made in Moscow. I think, you know, all, all the Russians can do is, is exaggerate and exacerbate these issues. So I'll, I'll come on to the kind of, the, therefore, the, the best response to that. But when it comes down to it, this is a, a regime in Moscow that in my opinion is essentially transitional. That Putin and his immediate cr cronies who are all basically the same generation are the last proper homo sovieticus generation. They're the people who didn't just go to school or university but also had their, their early formative career years in Soviet times. And they were on the whole 
ones who could, could expect a, a good life in the Soviet system. And suddenly all of that collapsed. They went through this, this sort of trauma where literally overnight they went from being citizens of one of the two global superpowers to being citizens of this ramshackle new country, which you know, was regarded more as a problem than a player in the world scene. Um, and you know, the, the post-imperial backlash is, is always going to be a tough one. I mean, one can one can speculate how much Brexit is still you know, a reflection of Britain's sense that it is somehow a special country. So we shouldn't be surprised if actually on, on a much shorter time scale, you know, Russia is, is going to have it harder to, to, to lose the assumptions of superpower status. But nonetheless, I mean, I think it is very clear that there's a very, very different generation coming up below. I, I'm not necessarily saying a better generation, but on the whole, the generation that below is not so ideological. They are ruthless, pragmatic kleptocrats. In the West, we know how to deal with kleptocrats. And we do so all the time, all around the world. We don't have a problem, unfortunately, with, with kleptocrats. This is the sort of the ideological dimension of Putinism that is problematic. This sense that there is somehow a challenge. The generation below, they go along with Putin because they have no real alternative, but essentially they want to be able to do the classic thing of steal abroad, sorry, steal at home, bank abroad. They want to be able to buy their penthouse in New York and send their kids to Cambridge or Oxford and have a nice villa in the south of France and all these other kind of perks of being part of a global system. And actually, the fortress Russia that Putin is building does not work for that. So the, the risk is if we start getting hybrid with them, what we actually do is we fix this notion of the West as the enemy. Whenever Russians are appalled, they do not regard themselves as being at war. They have a much, much better view of the West than the West has of, of Russians. In, after, in opinion poll after opinion poll, we, we see this. And just my own personal experience when, 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 when I'm actually in, in Russia, even when you get involved in these long conversations where people insist on telling you all the things that the West has done wrong, it's always more in sorrow than in anger. It's don't you realize that we are, you know, we're, we're part of Europe and so forth. And why, why are you being so unfair? So, I mean, I think the danger is that we actually play to Putin's legitimating narrative. that the West is against us. The world is a dangerous place. The world hates Russians. And that's why everyone needs to be part of this kind of conscripted mobilization state to assert Russia. Instead, we should be doing our best to fix the issues at home that the Russians capitalize on. I mean, this is deterrence by denial that actually makes it very hard. You know, you know if, if actually we didn't have large portions of our population who mistrust their media and their politicians, if we didn't have a lot of the sort of the, the key internal divisions, if we didn't have, frankly, um, ridiculously inadequate means of policing what is said on social media, you know, all of these various things, this, you know, corruption, the, 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 the lack of transparency in terms of, of electoral funds and so forth. I know I'm, I'm, I'm sitting on, on, on one of my soapboxes here, but I think there is so much that we can do, which not just will help protect us against Russian meddling, but will protect us against meddling by anyone. Because I'm actually a lot more worried about how China could capitalize on this in the next five, 10 years than Russia. Russia, I don't believe it's, I wouldn't, I don't like this idea of say calling Russia a declining power, but I think Russia, you might say its zeal will go when, when the Putin generation goes. China is definitely a rising power. And we've seen that they're perfectly willing to use all kinds of um, less than entirely overt and, and, and uh, friendly ways of asserting their influence. If we continue to fail to address these issues within our own system, then it's gonna be the Chinese and others who will exploit that. I completely agree I, I, with you. I will stop, stop my, my little um, sermon there. No, no, I completely agree with you. We need to uh, solve our problems from within because it's our own fault that um, the faith in democracy is declining. It's nobody else's fault. And if we can consolidate what it really means to be a liberal democracy at home and um, be a good example for others that may seek to follow suit, and just remind uh, you know the world that uh, it might be an imperfect system, but it's probably the best one that exists. 
uh, we can be, you know, stronger and more unified uh, against powers that do seek to divide us or that do seek to change norms uh, and uh, the way that we operate internationally. So I'm glad you brought up China because, um, so the main themes of this video podcast series include great power competition, the transatlantic relationship and disinformation campaigns. I think we've spoken a lot about uh, Russian disinformation, propaganda, hybrid tactics. So let's, uh, let's end uh, our conversation here with a question on the Russia-Chinese relationship. So ever since 2014, the West has applied uh, some harsh sanctions onto Russia, and this has only pushed Russia further into the arms of China. So how would you, first of all, define this Russian-Chinese friendship, quote unquote, and um, do you think that this is the right way to, to respond to Russia from the transatlantic alliance? So are we more, is it more in our interest to try to approach Russia so that it doesn't go in the hands of China or, or how do you view this uh, relationship there? Yeah, I, I don't get the sense, frankly, that there is huge enthusiasm for China in, in Moscow. Um, quite the opposite, actually. China, I think, scares them intensely. After all, you think about it, I mean, China, you, you've got the, the longest land border in the world with, with this rapidly rising, economically dynamic, rapidly arming, and also certainly, especially from, from this year, increasingly assertive China. There's no question but that in, through, through, in, in conventional terms, Russia east of the Ural Mountains is indefensible if the Chinese want, wanted to go in there. And basically you have you know, relatively small garrisons along this kind of ribbon of the baikal Amur and Trans-Siberian railways, which are also the primary supply lines and which let's be you know, brutally honest, would be cut within 10 minutes of the start of, of any conflict. The Russians are fully aware that if, and this is all very kind of speculative, but if there was a conflict, then at the moment, nuclear weapons is the only way that they could actually possibly um, fight it. More broadly, they are well aware that all the rhetoric aside, China is not their friend. And I think the classic example was this massive hydrocarbons deal that was concluded after Crimea and after the imposition of, of Western sanctions. Putin needed a deal with China. He needed a deal not just for economic reasons, but also for political reasons to basically show to the West, you can put as many sanctions as you want, but we've still got a very big friend, you know. The Chinese knew that and therefore as a result, pushed incredibly hard on that deal. I hesitate, I and mean, it's probably not the appropriate language, but it's hard not to just simply say the Russians were thoroughly screwed in those deals. So much so that not all, as I understand it, the financials have been fully released, just to, would demonstrate just basically how, how parlous it was. And then more recently, if we look at the, the very large um, Vostok military exercises that, that, that were held last year, a lot was made about the fact that this time we actually had Chinese forces participating in them. I remember talking to one of the uh, defense attaches, uh, Moscow-based defense attaches who'd actually been able to go there, and who was saying that the Chinese forces were very much kept to a small enclosed part of the exercise. And he'd heard that the Chinese weren't even allowed to be part of the strategic command post exercise part of the whole thing. Furthermore, the Chinese hadn't been involved in the naval side of the exercise. So what did they do? They sent a spy ship to shadow um, the, the, the Russian forces that were there. That does not, to me, sound like your great friend and ally. It's not, I think, how NATO tends to roll. Um, but on the other hand, the Russians knew full well that we would obsess, as we did, about the Chinese presence there. Every time that there's some statement, every time there's some kind of deal or whatever about Rus Russo-Chinese relations, we prick up our ears and pay a lot more attention. And I think this is it from the Russians' point of view. China is a big long-term threat. But I think the parallel I've sometimes used is it's a little bit like climate change. 
they know it's massive and it's scary. They're not entirely sure what they would have to do about it though, and that they think that what they would have to do would be difficult and expensive. So they'll leave it until tomorrow. The West is today's challenge, and they feel that they need to have at least the semblance of the strategic partnership with China as a lever against the West to say, don't think that we're isolated. And also because there are certain interests in common. China is always tomorrow's challenge. And I think, again, from the point of view of the increasingly aged men who are actually running policy, there is a sense that they don't necessarily you know, it's need to adapt, attack the problem themselves. That is one that they, can, that they can and will leave for their successors. This is a can that has been kicked down the road for, well, arguably 20 years. And they feel it's got another 15 years of, of, of kicking left in it. So I think this is it. I, th I, think, I think we need to be aware that there's you know, considerable challenges. But the point is, absolutely, the one thing we could do is if we were a lot more aggressive towards Russia, such that the regime felt that it really was up against, you know, with it back against the wall, then they would have no option but to turn more to China. The thing is, from China's point of view, China cares much less about Russia than Russia cares about China. From China's point of view, Russia is useful as a source of things that you can just buy. You don't need to have a strategic partnership to buy someone's oil or gas. Above, beyond, beyond that, China regards Russia as an inconvenient large chunk of real estate between them and the markets that they really matter, that really matter to them in the Middle East and above all in Europe and in, obviously to an extent North America. Hence the Belt and Road Initiative, which is really as you know, much as anything else a way of just how can we get across these inconvenient territories? So bottom line is we shouldn't get too hysterical about a Russo-Chinese relationship. There is a natural um, antagonism there. The Russians do not consider themselves to be Eurasian, in my opinion. They ultimately consider themselves to be European their kind of European, not necessarily our kind of European, but nonetheless within the, the European cultural mainstream. China is scary, and especially as China gets more assertive. There is a belief that ultimately, somehow, Russia will have managed to, to rebuild its relationship with the West. If we make them think that that's impossible, then China will be the only game left for them to play. Yeah, that's true. And then some will say, uh, you know, that that's that would be the way for Russia to be more contained and to uh, not to act the way that it does, because we're, you know, we're acting kind of tough on Russia. So it feels forced to go to China, but yet their options with China are rather limited, too, because China is the bigger player. Um, or we could simply, uh, you know, try to be politically more friendly with Russia, work with Russia on pragmatic issues, not to have these two giants uh, working too much together in this uh, new world that we're facing, where, you know, we have values, uh, you know, of authoritarianism versus democracy and, um, you know, changing power dynamics and a great power competition, as they call it. So it was definitely uh, great to hear your perspective on that. And uh, as expected, it was a very interesting conversation. And I thank you so much for, for your time today. Well, my great pleasure. And for the audience, as usual, thanks for tuning back in to Security in the 21st Century and stay tuned for the next episode.